Hello, AP history students, and welcome to another session of AP Euroblast. As always, I'm here to spark your interest in European history, activate your memory, and draw connections. And today we're going to continue our series on black lives in European history. What would you say if I told you that the first underground railroad in North America was established in the 17th century rather than in the 19th? And that it went south to Florida rather than north to New England and Canada? Or that the first free black town in the United States was established there? All these statements are true, and it all happened here in St. Augustine, the oldest city in the United States, and home to the oldest masonry fort in the U.S. And it also happened here, just a little way from St. Augustine, in this settlement labeled by the British mapmaker simply as Negro Fort. The Spaniards who established the Negro Fort under royal decree gave it a much longer and more important name, Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mosé. Let's make it easier by just calling it Fort Mosé. But make sure to get the spelling and the pronunciation right. Fort Mose is no longer standing, but you can visit the site as well as San Marcos Fort of St. Augustine, where they are part of the U.S. National Park Service. Our focus today is going to be on the connected stories of St. Augustine and Fort Mose, and the racially diverse societies that lived there between the 16th and 18th centuries. And they're great stories, too, full of surprises, so make sure to stay tuned through to the end. The historical record, archaeological as well as documentary, has preserved quite a bit about these stories. But we also owe a great debt of gratitude to the Florida Museum of Natural History and to the state of Florida and the government of Spain for setting up and funding the research program that has brought Fort Mose's story to light. And I want to recognize two scholars in particular who have been at the forefront of this project, Professor Kathleen Deegan, an archaeologist, and Professor Jane Landers, an historian. Their work is the principal foundation of today's presentation. Check the description box for the full citations for these two books and other recommended reading. So, what kind of a place was St. Augustine in the early 17th century when our story begins? It was a sleepy, provincial backwater of several hundred people that didn't produce any wealth for the Spanish Empire. It depended heavily on support from Santo Domingo and from Cuba, militarily, economically, and spiritually. And it was racially mixed. Black, white, and native people lived there together. Some were slaves, but without plantations, slavery was a much smaller, more diverse, and more fluid institution than in other regions. Remember the social fluidity we saw between races in the first two videos? If you missed them, go back and have a look. Well, it was there in St. Augustine as well. I'm going to stick to just one anecdote for now, but there are many other examples of St. Augustine's racial fluidity. The very first recorded marriage in 1565, and the first for that matter in the United States, was an interracial one. There, in the presence of all the leading citizens of St. Augustine, Luisa de Abrego, a free black woman from Seville married Miguel Rodriguez, a white conquistador from Segovia. You can find a link in the description box to learn more about their fascinating and ultimately tragic story. Life in St. Augustine in 1670 probably wasn't much different than it had been a hundred years earlier. But then things began to change quickly. Starting with the construction of this fort in 1672, the Castillo de San Marcos. And over the next 90 years, frequent conflict between Spain and Great Britain shaped the destiny of St. Augustine and of its inhabitants. Why was conflict so frequent, you might ask? And why did they need this fortress in 1672? And why did Spain keep spending money on this place that produced no wealth in return? Great questions. San Marcos was what the Spanish called the Presidio, a strongly built, heavily defended fortress, and there were already several others like it. Strategic defense had always been Spain's main concern in Florida, and St. Augustine was well situated to protect Spanish shipping in the Caribbean, as well as routes leading to Mexican silver mines. But without a fortress, without a presidio, St. Augustine was vulnerable to the attacks of English pirates and other raiders, like this one, or this one. Additionally, by the late 17th century, the threat from the British seemed to be getting worse. In 1670, the British established Charlestown, today's Charleston, in nearby South Carolina. And only 15 years earlier, the British had conquered Jamaica from Spain. It was a recent memory that made the settling of Carolina seem much more threatening. But conflict between Spain and Britain wasn't just about strategic defense. It was about people, specifically Native Americans and black people. And it was about how differently Spain and Britain viewed them. For the Spanish in Florida, Native Americans and black people were mostly valuable as loyal subjects and soldiers. St. Augustine was always desperately short of settlers, so black people and natives were a welcome presence from the beginning. With the building of a presidio, that need became even greater. According to one source, the garrisons that defended the forts throughout the Spanish Empire ranged between 15 and 90 percent black, and St. Augustine was no exception. Spain also viewed black and native peoples, as it did all Spanish subjects, as souls needing protection and instruction under the Catholic faith. And over the previous hundred years, Spain had developed hundreds of Catholic missions in northern Florida, where tens of thousands of native Floridians lived. The British viewed black people and Native Americans very differently. 
the British saw them primarily as slave labor and profit. Indigo and rice plantations expanded quickly in South Carolina and required a large number of black slaves. By 1708, black people there already outnumbered whites. And since their only purpose was plantation slavery, it was not only easy, but it was convenient for white Carolinians to dehumanize black Carolinians. In such a society, the 1565 interracial wedding of Luis Abrego and Miguel Rodriguez would have been unthinkable. And in the early 18th century, the British exported even more Native American slaves to the Caribbean colonies than they imported Africans to Carolina. Several tens of thousands, in fact. And how did they get so many Native Americans so quickly, you might ask? By raiding the Spanish missions of Florida, of course. And how did Spain, in turn, meet its needs for more inhabitants in St. Augustine? By encouraging the flight of Carolina slaves, of course. And that is how the free black population of Florida grew, and Fort Mose eventually came to exist. And that's a big part of why there was so much fighting between the Spanish and British in Florida and in modern-day regions of the states of South Carolina and Georgia. From the late 17th century until the second half of the 18th century, hundreds of black people escaped bondage in Carolina and, with the encouragement and assistance of Spain, found a better life in St. Augustine. 1686 is the next important date in our storyline. In that year, as the St. Marcos Fort was still being built, the Spanish sent a raiding party to Carolina and took 13 slaves with them back to St. Augustine. And since St. Augustine itself was racially diverse, so too was the raiding party. It included 53 black and native people. The next year, eight more Carolinian slaves came by their own means, including a couple with a three-year-old daughter. Did the 1686 raid influence the independent flight of those eight Carolinians? Did those new arrivals see the raid capture as a liberation? They probably did because the British government demanded that the Spanish return not only the 13 slaves they had taken in 1686, but also unspecified others who daily fled to Florida. But the Floridians weren't having any of it. We don't know if these early migrants remained free in Florida, but we do know that freedom became the official policy because King Charles II issued a royal decree from Madrid in 1693. Based on the recommendations from the Spanish governors of Florida, any slave who was ready to accept Catholicism and swear loyalty to the King of Spain was rewarded with freedom. Knowing the way that colonial policy often worked, there's a very good chance that the governors had been enacting that policy even earlier. It should be mentioned that one governor did allow the sale of Carolina slaves between 1729 and 1737. But this seems to have been the exception in a 70-year policy. With one simple action, then, Spain populated a poor, remote, and vulnerable outpost and economically damaged her enemies. Black people also experienced a satisfying twofer. By escaping bondage, they achieved a better life for themselves and their families, and they also brought revenge on their masters by stealing their property themselves. And Spain couldn't have had more luck. These new Spanish subjects turned out to be excellent fighters. Both Spanish and British documents record this. Some may have bought their fighting experience directly from West Africa, but additionally many had proved themselves in the Yamasee War of 1715 to 1717 as allies of native people who nearly wiped Carolina from the map. Before getting to a closer examination of who these people were, let's take a quick look at the rest of the timeline of Spanish Florida. In 1738, Fort Mose was built. Around 100 people, black soldiers and their families, lived there for the next two years. In 1740, the British invaded from Carolina. They took Fort Mose. Everyone fled to St. Augustine. There they continued to fight bravely, and they eventually drove the British away. And they took back Fort Mose. But no one could live there anymore because it was destroyed in the fighting. So they moved to St. Augustine, and everyone lived there until 1752. And they seemed to like it. When the Spanish governor ordered Fort Mose rebuilt and repopulated that year, they did not like that. Some rebelled, and the governor used force. So Fort Mose was rebuilt and resettled. Two years later, the French and Indian War started in the Ohio Valley in upstate New York and Canada. The Floridians couldn't have cared less because it was between the French and the British, and it was far away. And they still couldn't have cared less when that war became part of the much larger Seven Years' War in 1756. But then Spain got involved and lost Havana and the Philippines. And the Floridians did care about that. And right they were to care, because guess what? Spain swapped Florida with the British to get back Havana and the Philippines. So what happened to the inhabitants of St. Augustine and Fort Mose? Didn't they just become British subjects? Nope. They all left for Cuba. And there our timeline ends. Or almost. Florida briefly returned to Spanish rule from 1784 to 1790. Spain recaptured it as part of their campaign against Britain and in support of the 13 colonies gaining their independence. But the tensions that they had with the British before simply continued with the Americans. Politically, the American Revolution brought change to South Carolina and Georgia, but economically and socially, things continued much the same as before. White Carolinians and Georgians maintained a plantation economy, and they viewed black people no differently than during British rule. And Spain again offered asylum to slaves willing to become loyal Catholic Spanish subjects. A few hundred made it, 
and countless others attempted escape. So who exactly were these courageous people who risked everything to find a better life in Spanish Florida, and who later gave up everything to defend their new home and welcome new escapees? Stay tuned to find out next time. I hope you've enjoyed this new addition to AP Euroblast as part of the Black Lives in European History series. Please check the bibliography and suggestions for further reading in the description box. And as always, please leave your own comments, including your suggestions for future episodes. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and keep learning. Thanks for watching. It's been a blast. Uh -huh.